now we're going to talk about needs and desires of citizens, platforms, human-centered design, and we're going to be in three talks about different ways of exploring these needs, desires, designing platforms, designing services, which are focusing on specifically the needs and desires of different citizens on different localities, and how to bring it all in a way that makes sense over resources that are being scarce and to be sustainable in the way they are de designed, okay? So our first speaker uh, of the morning for this panel is Stefano. So Stefano is the design strategist, strategist and service designer at Continuum, and he's focusing his work and studies in human-centered innovation. So Stefano, please come up to the stage. Welcome Stefano, please. Hi. So, I hope you had a, a great dinner with Visit yesterday. Mine was uh, fantastic, and also the wine was fantastic, but this morning I needed to come here at 10, so it was like kind of a pity. Uh, but I'm super happy to be here with you. Um, and like, I go to the next, okay. So, I think many of you at least uh, uh, once talking with a friend, they heard the following description of Uber, for example. Like, um, it's a, an app that lets you um, move from, from A point to B point in the city. Well, actually, Uber is not one app. Uber is a great service that uses a digital platform as a, like, as a main component. And this, like, um, allow people to move from, from A to B. But uh, the digital component is not really the core. More and more, um, in our um, service that we experience uh, daily, um, the digital component is getting uh, more footprint and the human one a little bit less. But at the same time, the value of this few human interaction is like rising a lot. So um, again, um, thinking about services that we define as digital, um, without humans sometimes, they wouldn't have sense. And um, at the end, when we, uh, we rate the, uh, the Uber service, what we rate is not really the technology, but is the experience of the driving that we have with the uh, driver. Um, and you can get sometimes lucky with the driver too. I mean. um, so, um, people are really at the core of services. So, for example, with Amazon Prime now, uh, what I understood is that it was important to brand um, the journey till the last mile. So they had people from their brand delivering goods to you. They want to have this imprinting with you from the digital platform, from the, uh, uh, for the online store, to the uh, physical delivery. Um, for example, when I look at um, the, the meal delivery services, I think there are heroes delivering gorgeous meal to my doorsteps. And this is what I remember about the service together with the meal, of course, but the, digital, the human part is uh, uh, tremendously important for me. Um, I had a chance to work as a service designer for a project called Audi On, the, on Demand in uh, San Francisco. And um, the main uh, delight factors for people were like, um, I mean, this is like a premium door-to-door -door car rental service for a company that first was designing uh, products and selling products, and now is starting to enter the service market. So um, one of the main uh, frictions that we removed there was like um, having people to go somewhere to pick up their cars. But now there are like people they will you the cars wherever you are and whenever you want. Uh, second pain point that we uh, removed was to have, uh, for example, the car that you choose that is not the same. Uh, so with, with car rental, you, you, you're never able really to get the car that you want. Uh, with this service, yes. You, you can get really the exact color that, uh, that you booked. Um, another super nice delight factor was, was that we removed the friction of the... Um, feeling at the beginning, when you rent one car, um, you, have, you feel like an idiot for 30 seconds because you don't know where is the, the, the main brake, how to pair your personal devices with a 60K car maybe that you just rented for the weekend. And so at the end, what people remembered um, 
well, I mean, talking with them during the interviews, was that um, what they remember are the people that, that deliver car to them. This is the main thing. Um, we also e experience, for example, the, um, let's say, the, um, like with Airbnb, uh, with Airbnb uh, sorry, with, um, with, the, uh, with the hoteling, um, the problem of the uh, commoditization of the hotel experience. Um, so when we go somewhere and we stay in one uh, big hotel chain, uh, the experience that we get is mainly the same wherever we go. Instead, like with Airbnb, uh, with Airbnb uh, what they understood was that um, they, I mean, they needed to leverage on these um, key difference that is uh, personalizing the experience for uh, the customer. So the, the host becomes the curator of the experience. And this is what is key for, Airbnb, uh, for this company. Like. Um, so also the mutual trust is really important um, and is at the base of many peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, experiences. Uh, like for example with, with uh, Drivey, uh, trust is fundamental. Without that you can't go on. Um, also, in a, another recent uh, project for microfinance in uh, Jordan that I just finished, um, basically people started, uh, I mean people that needed to repay loans um, at branches that were far from their villages, um, they saw as more convenient to go somewhere closer, so to small merchants to repay their loans. Um, and so they started trusting their local communities more than the, uh, the bank for repaying their loans. Um, so, like to recap, in order to uh, like design services that like um, that are valuable for people, but also that bring uh, uh, value to the businesses that deliver them and to the peers that uh, deliver them too, um, we need to consider the digital components not as the core elements, but as a, as a main tool that um, can make really the service uh, working better, more se seamlessly. Um, we need to uh, try to embed as much as possible uh, people as active um, player in services because they are kind of the elements that can really make the moment of truth happening with the brand in a more memorable way. Uh, we need to encourage really people, the, the host, uh, the peers, to curate the experience because this is like um, the only way to create a really personal and memorable and um, emotional experience and um, of course trust we need to foster the um, mutual trust between uh, um, like the users and the peers who deliver services uh, in order to create really long-lasting relationships so i want to thank you Pleasure to make a visit. Oh, no, 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 it's better. Thank you. So I just have the pleasure to receive her services from the platform yesterday at a Parisian host, which cooked amazing meal for 14 people, told a lot about of the history of the neighborhood and so on. And basically, what Visit does is to connect people that are meet, meet, willing to meet local chefs and to understand the culture, and then to build a community or maybe business, business partnership and so on. So it's a great, great social dining and it's the largest social leading uh, dining platform in Europe. So Camille, please come to the stage. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, so as Thomas said, I'm the co-founder of a startup which is called Visit. And probably some of you guys had an amazing dinner last night and I hope well, it was great and that you enjoyed it. So basically what we do is that we connect travelers and locals around the mill at their home in more than one, uh, 100 countries over the world. We launched a startup in July 2014 and what happened at that time is that we recruited some hosts around us. So it was basically friends and family. Uh, because we have to start a, a community anyway. And after that, well, we, I would say, we try to f recruit hosts and um, people who love to cook, who love to travel. Uh, it's a bit like couch surfing, but for food, some people call it like social dining or food surfing. And we found that, that um, 
like your community is changing like very very quickly and for example in July 2015 we had only 1500 hosts and five months after, we, it happened that we have 15,000 hosts. So it was an amazing growth, and, and uh, like Visit has been wor found working really well. Uh, we have to manage a community in more than, than, I don't know, like four different languages on the website, and we were not precisely ready for it. Uh, it was a huge boost. So what we've learned is that we have to get to know our users. and. Um, Maybe it's something like very obvious for everyone, but you may have uh, users who are not the one that you originally think would join your platform. So of course we had a lot of we have a lot of millennials, around 30% of our users and our hosts are millennials. But we also have a lot of baby boomers. We had a lot of double income, no kids, and more than 60% of our hosts are women. Um, and well, when we had a huge boost on our community, we found that, that we have many, many different categories of hosts. And what our job every day and as a CEO is to combine the needs and the desires of all the different categories of hosts. So it was, it was a real challenge for us. And we found that, that we have like professional hosts, uh, professional chefs, like they do this because it's their job. They know how to cook like perfectly well. They can like serve 20 people in the same, around the same table. We also have many, many food lovers. We call them food lovers because they really love to cook. The, the main reason they do this is they want to share their passion. They want to meet new people from around the world. Uh, it's an additional income, but it's not the, I would say it's not the, the main reason they want to do it. They just want to experience the social, uh, the, the social interactions and to meet new people. And we also have occasional chefs. They do this like once in a month or, or once every two months. And it's the same idea. They really want to, to meet new people. And, uh, but they do this like only like sometimes when they have time. So we had a problem after this because we found that, that we have unexpected segments of users uh, that appear on our platform and they join the platform. So what, what do we have to do with them? Some segments may be very far from your core values. So how, with a, with a hyper, during hypergrowth, can you maintain, I would say, um, an harmony <laughs> and, uh, and bring like really like stick to your values, core values? And how to, do you maintain, uh, maintain the sense of your community? And you facilitate professionalization. For example, for the food lovers, we want to welcome more and more people and the professional chef, uh, but not, but not like put, put on the side the, the, the people that would do it like once, once a while. And so how do you handle this hyper growth on your community and how do you help to meet all these different needs and desires? So what happened is that we decided that, okay, so what can we bring uh, what kind of value can we bring to our hosts to create loyalty? Because, for example, the professional chef, the problem that we have is that they are not very uh, loyal. That like they want to to like have their uh, full table and many people around their table. So, how do you do precisely uh, to to help them like really keep the sense uh, of of the values, the visit values? So, what we decided, for example, is that visits it's all about sitting around the table together. So, all the professional chef, for example, that do not sit with their guests they can't be on the platform anymore. And it's heartbreaking because you recruit them for months and, and at a stage you have to say, okay, no, now you, you don't really feel, uh, you don't really like are part of our community anymore. And we really wanted to preserve the sense of our community. And we decided, okay, so what we can do is that we can help them to be better hosts. We can uh, like mentor them and, and train them to be better hosts, to, to, cook, to cook well, to, I don't know, like, practice different languages and also give them the tools to progress, to have better profiles, uh, to meet other people because there is uh, a, a real emulation between all the hosts that we really wanted to promote and facilitate. And of course, we can, what we can do as a platform is also promote and give visibility to the best hosts. Uh, so that's what we've did, done with, uh, with, for example, like videos and, and promote them on, on our website and all on social media and they really like it. Oh. So, in fact, we divided our, our program of, of professionalization on t with two pillars, empower the host and educate the host. So, for example, we, we are just launching a mobile app that will be out in, in two weeks. Uh, so, we co-build the mobile app with our community. So, 
usually people say for communities that you have, you really have to, to meet your, your community, to spend time with them, but people don't actually do it. And it really takes time because we, we were uh, in, in Spain, in France, uh, in Italy, and we really took the time to meet our host and to understand what kind of features they really need and, uh, and what kind of, of um, uh, yeah, feature we can add to the, to the mobile app. And we made like all, all many, many tests during, during the, the well, the building of the app with them, and after also like technical tests with them, so they can feel they are part of visits, and they are because without them we're we're nothing. So it's a huge work, but we've done it, and we're quite proud of that. Uh, all the former hosts now they can relaunch a program, and they can validate and and coach new hosts. Uh, so it's a host meets host program, and um, and we know that for example when you when you welcome people at your table for the first time it can be a bit like worrying i would say for the first 2 minutes you will say okay who is going to ring a to ring at my door who are they exactly so it's better if your first experience is with hosts that are already on the platform it's it gives you fine it, it helps to build trust i would say and it's um it, it's great to well engage your community we define it, for example, for the professional chef. They ask for more and more feature on the dashboard because they want to, to have many people around their table, but they want to manage very easily their bookings. So we decided to work specifically with them to define the functionalities of a new dashboard that we're currently working on. And we also help them to, to, to personalize more their, their, their profiles and the because, because they, we wanted them to be able to showcase their skills, their cooking skills and their hosting skills. And the Educate program, it's a, so the first one you, you can't really see it, it's like one-to-one -one support. Like I would really say that at Visit, there is something that we do well, it's, it's that we talk with our community and we have a, a dedicated support, so special thanks to Julie, <laughs> who might be watching. Um, so they know us and they know that they can call us anytime and we can help them to be better, to, to, to help them to well, fill, fill out their profile uh, and if there is anything wrong, we, we, we are here. And it's the most important thing for our community and it helps them like, to, to really be more professional. So provide advice is, of course, uh, advice is like from us, but also from other hosts, because we have to nurture our community and help them grow. And we showcase also the best hosts, as I said. Uh, for example, we can have a like, professional chef that will meet occasional and casual chef um, and, and help them, for example, I know that to take amazing like, Instagram food pictures or how to, how to have a, an amazing dinner like, that you can cook in less than 30 minutes. That's the kind of thing we really wanted our community and, and to, to, well, to give to our community. And we also organize like thematic meetups, a lot of meetings with our community. It's very, very important. And we do this like four or five times every month. And we gather and mix all, all of our users. No, no matter if they are a chef, if they are, if they are like occasional, uh, very occasional or food lovers, we have to mix them and um, so, so we can like preserve the sense of the community uh, because it, it's a it's a huge it's a huge gap between all the kinds of desires that they have and we really have to to keep uh, to keep them like united behind our values and our concepts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camille. Hello, hello. Yes. So when we see design, we see what's happening. We see the many more platforms that may come out of it. We see a platform that is already running and going so well, but this may lead to rise of consumerism as well. We may come from products that become services, but in the end, we are still consuming a lot of resources. Resources are scarce. Resources are getting much, much more expensive, and we have a great environmental challenge to be tackling on. So that's why I'm inviting here Luisa Santiago, which is the head of Ellen MacArthur Foundation in Brazil. She was uh, studying for years now circular economy. She just did her first master's degrees in Latin America on circular economy. And she'll be talking a little bit about how to develop circular economy models and designs. So please welcome Luisa. Everyone. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Bon dia. Thank you, Tomás. Thank you, Camille. Visit dinner yesterday was just perfect. The host was amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so just to start the conversation, who here hasn't, hasn't heard hear about um, the circular economy? Hands up. Has never heard about? Who has heard about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation? Right. 
Um, okay, so um, the Alan MacArthur Foundation is a foundation based in, um, in the UK, in the Isle of Wight, in the south of the UK. Uh, it's, it's named after Ellen MacArthur. <coughs> Excuse me. She was a sailor, the fastest person to go solo around the world on a sailing boat in 2005. And when she came back, um, she got this view that we were living and running our economy under uh, constraints of finite resources, just as she did in her in her sailing trip. Um, and then after that, she just decided to leave the sport and then to start going around talking to CEOs, to chief executives, chief um, financial officers and governments to, to, to try to come up with an idea of what would be a model that would work in the long term. And that's how the idea of a circular economy was born. Basically, truth is, the industrial model that we have been running since the industrial revolution is no, long, is no longer working. And it's not new for anyone here in this room, I'm sure. It's based on a linear model where you take materials from the, from the nature and then you make and consume products and you just dispose of them. And there are wastes all over the process. It's, it's full of structural waste. And that's how we've been running growth and prosperity in our economy since, since the, the, the verge of the Industrial Revolution. This has been working so far for the many goals we put as um, prosperity, growth, Everything that we consider success in our economic model so far, they, this model, this linear model, has addressed a lot of them. Uh, in these graphics, you can see, just to name a few, growth in GDP, growth in urbanization, growth in water consumption, growth in education, go growth in many indicators that we considered successful measures for this model. But this is also, looking at the curve trend, this is also related to the same thing when it comes to um, what happens to the living systems. The earth systems that actually um, are the basis of and safety of life in, on earth. So here, just to name a few of them, as we grew all the socioeconomic development indicators, we also grew um, emissions of several types of um, greenhouse gases. We also grew in, in the loss of biodiversity. We also grew in land degradation and so on and so forth. Um, many of the um, sustainability initiatives that started to come up in the business and the government sectors since, let's say, the 70s, all the, the whole environmental narrative, they were really dealing with incremental change. A lot of the sustainability initiatives, and I'm saying that because I myself was an executive during sustainability um, consultant for mining, oil and gas, and many other kinds of industries, uh, we, were, we were just gaining time. We were doing incremental things. So we were taking out um, the whole waste, for example, that we were generating and you know, finding strategies to recycle or to do some things that we, we were just going in the same way, but we were just gaining time. Um, and also, after 2000s, a lot, of, a lot has changed in the economy, really. Uh, after the 2000s, with the whole boom of commodities, mostly driven by the development of emerging economies like China, like India, and like Brazil, where I come from, um, there was a huge difference. So the whole exponential growth that we saw in those graphics, they, they got even steeper. But then, very quickly, a whole change in the system has started to drive changes to the whole economic system itself. For example, the whole economic losses that we saw, a lot of structural waste, um, a lot, of course, of um, price volatility. Brazil is now under a recession, uh, first year of a, of a recession. Well, a country that was considered an emerging economy till past, well, a couple of years ago. Uh, mostly because it, ha it had a short-term investment in extractive industries, basically. So the pr price volatility, it's, it's putting economies at risk and it's putting businesses at risk as well. And then you have demographic pressures, of course, billions of people growing, growing populations, especially in the southern world, and most of them going to urban areas. So urbanization is also a drive for change on that. Um, but of course, we're all here, united here in this fest, the third edition of a fest to talk about new business models, to talk about sharing, to talk about collaborative economy. It's not only about business models, but there's a lot of startups here, there's many companies, many um, new businesses emerging from new business models that are being accepted by new generations. And also, of course, enablers like the technology, which are enabling these kind of business models, but also enabling a lot of innovation in production processes 
how people are talking, how people are connecting to each other, how machines are connecting to each other. The whole fourth industrial revolution that the World Economic Forum has been talking about. The Internet of Things, 3D printing, so many technologies that are driving changes in the way we do and generate value in our economy. Um, and then the whole idea of a circular economy comes um, as an economy that is restorative and regenerative by design. And why is that? Because we need to think of an economy that works in the long term rather than an economy that is just looking at short-term view. An economy that has impact for businesses, positive impact for um, the earth systems, and of course, positive impact for the society. So the way we frame it in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we say the circular economy is a, an economy that is restorative and regenerative by design. So it, it's, it enables keeping value, products, components, and materials at the highest utility and, and value at all times. And then it's also eliminating the concept of waste, which is an anomaly of our economy. Waste doesn't exist. So materials should be flowing and, and stocks should be managed in a way that we keep their values rather than just extracting new inputs and having losses and losses structured in the, in the, in the model itself. And it's, in the end, a system that works better in the long term and at all scales, which means within a company, within a city, within um, a society, but within the globe. So it's a system that works better and the parts will work better because the system works better. Um, it's not a new idea, it's built, um, as I mentioned before, when Alan started to go around and seeing and talking to people, thought leaders, established academics, um, to come up with this framework. So, credit to credo, um, the performance economy, uh, biomimicry, industrial ecology, so many schools of thought that are part of this uh, new concept. The concept that has been evolving, actually. Um, and this, this diagram there, it's a butterfly diagram, as we call it. And you see here, very easily in the middle, what you see is the linear model when you extract materials, either renewables or finite resources, and then you produce parts, components, products, and then you just sell them, and then you just have all the waste. Um, what we want in a circular economy, ultimately, is to really get rid of the, um, the, ne the necessity to input more materials into the system, but also, uh, and, and mostly, to eliminate the waste in it. And there are many business models, there are many value creation uh, levers that you can leverage. And that's the whole work that the foundation has been doing since 2010 when it was founded. We work with businesses, governments, um, cities, uh, startups, innovators, uh, academia, to come up with and evolve with um, the concept of a circular economy, but also to generate practice, to show that it's a model that works better. And we've been really successful in doing that. So. Um, what we want to see there, and this diagram here kind of shows visually many kinds and levers of value generation in an economy. When you look at the left side of the butterfly diagram, what you see is the cycle of um, bio-nutrients. So it's a bio-cycle. It's, it's meant to be regenerative. It's meant to regenerate natural capital. It's meant to come up with um, models to extract value, considering the entropy, of course, because it's bio-nutrients. But, o but also extracting value um, and, and avoiding uh, putting anything toxic back into the environment. So you rebuild natural capital while generating economic value. And now in the, in the right side of the butterfly diagram, what you see is the tech cycle, which is mostly the whole thing that is based on um, finite resources, mining, uh, anything that comes from uh, the crust. So what you want there, and you see a, a huge change here, is about we no longer talk about consumers, we talk about users, which is pretty obvious for all of us here in this room. So the performance model, the sharing models, the reuse, redistribute models, there's, also, there's a lot of value being generated and businesses are catching those values and capturing this um, and generating much more value out of the same units of materials. So as you go further to the, out part, to the outer loops, you lose value. The inner loops are the ones where you, where you keep more value. And there is profitability on it. That's the whole difference between what sustainability narrative would say, and I had that problem because I was a sustainability consultant and I could never talk about anything with the CEOs of companies. I was just talking about, you know, complementary things, compliance-driven things, tangible, like touching the business but never changing the business. And the narrative of the circular economy, the whole thing is it brings the businesses on board, which is really important. We are talking about companies that pretty much run 70% of the resources in the world. Um, 
And there is also a lot of generation in terms of new cash flows. So multiple cash flows that can localize and valorize underutilized assets. This is all possible. That's, that's all part of a, a model that really uh, keeps the materials components at the highest level and highest utilities at all times and for a long term. So basically, we've been creating this knowledge. The foundation now works with, uh, well, our mission is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. So we work with a real, really systemic approach. We work, we work with a multi-stakeholder multi uh, approach. So we work with insight and analysis, all the concepts and knowledge that we have been created. It's all open source. It's all in our website, all the reports. So we have strong partnerships to do that. McKinsey is our, our knowledge partner. The World Economic Forum is part of our main networks, driving change in a large scale, in a global scale. Uh, but we also work with education and training. So we want to inspire generations. We, work, we want to create the new professionals and the new knowledge, the new curriculums uh, to, to drive and to really go th towards the circular economy. So we have a huge network of pioneer universities working with new masters, curriculum development, research lines. But we also work with informal education, with online festivals, uh, the Disruptive Innovation Festival, for example, that runs every year now. Um, but we, will, we work really close with businesses and governments. We have our global partners. You probably saw in the first slide of my presentation some of the small players, like Google, like Cisco, Philips, etc., that are a part of our global partners. Um, and we have a network, the C100 program, which puts together in a collaborative, uh, pre-competitive collaboration pro uh, innova and innovation platform, 100 organizations, most of them businesses, but startups as well, governments, um, academia, and other like-minded organizations, to create, to be a living lab of practices. We want to see practice. We want to accelerate a transition. And of course, we work with governments like the European Union that launched a package on, on a directive package last December on circular economy, influenced by the knowledge and, and the concept of a circular economy that we created. And of course, we want to communicate that. So there is a number of publications as well available for all the public. Um, so that's basically what we do. That's what we believe. The circular economy has been generating a lot of changes in terms of how to satisfy needs, desires of new, of new um, concepts and new consumers that are not, not only consumers anymore, but producers as well, much more active using technologies and using new concepts to interact. Um, so I hope I'll be around, I hope, no, I hope to see you around to talk a little bit more about what we do and about the cycle economy. Thank you so much for listening to me.